Today on Locked on Phoenix Suns, there might be a difference this season between who the Suns start and who closes, given that they have so much depth from the offseason. So let's debate who should start, who should close, and what's the difference, and what's the value of it. Let's go. You are Locked on Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we're back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Brendan Clean, your host and a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past seven seasons. That over there, my new co-host, Ben Garcia, and the executive producer of The Drive over on Fox Sports 910. Welcome in. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen to kick off your Wednesday we march toward the return to daily shows in two weeks. Hit follow or subscribe if you haven't already. Be coming every day you're here with the show. Join the thousands of others doing just that. And get locked on to the Phoenix Suns every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook. All FanDuel customers through September 22nd can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. All right, Ben. I think this might be the topic you and I have returned to the most as we've uh, started out here talking Suns together, and it's a fun one. Who closes for this team? Who starts for this team? What the difference is? What combos we kind of like? And zooming out, why those combos and the amount of them that the Suns seem to have is actually going to be a big strength regardless of who you like in each different capacity there. So. Give us your closers. Let's just start it off. Who are, the, who are the five players you want on the court when it is really down to business for this Suns team this season? So you and I talked about this pre-show. We we genuinely actually do some sort of prep before the show. We don't just hop on here. And one of the things that you and I talked about was starting and closing, which is more important. That's what we'll, what we'll lead off with. And we'll talk about starting in just a second. But Closing a game is clearly way more important than starting a game for numerous reasons that we'll get into in a little bit here. But the reason why I have these five guys closing the game is because we're just, I'm assuming, going to paint the picture of they're either up five by five points or they're down by five points. That's kind of the criteria that I went with. And if that's the case, I would expect these guys all health being okay. We're just assuming everyone's healthy in this scenario. These guys have enough chemistry together. And the reason why I'm backing all this up is because I've mentioned a certain someone should go to the bench. But closing games, it should very clearly be Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, switch off whoever wants to run the point there. I'd probably prefer Bradley Beal to do so. Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, Royce O'Neal to add a little bit of length and width he's not exactly the biggest guy on the floor but it's best what the sun's got kevin durant and i struggled with this last one because we just we don't we don't know what we have in mason Plumley, but you can't get any smaller so you're just praying that yusuf nurkic can be a little bit better defensively this year as an anchor for this team at the center position so closing a game just to recap beal book o'neal kevin durant yusuf nurkic do you have the same starting five as me or close? Before I reveal that, let's let's go through some things, right? So we all know how bad the Suns were in the fourth quarter last year. That that was a talking point all season. It, it got a little bit better over the second half, but not by much. And they didn't even get to fourth close fourth quarters against Minnesota, but they did not have the, the gumption in that series either. But even like basically what you described is a clutch game within five points in the last five minutes. They were minus 13 over the full course of the whole season. They played 41 clutch games, and they were outscored by 13 across those games. I believe it was, uh, let's see how many total minutes that was, 145. Not great. Middle of the pack, but not good for a team that should have three killers in their lineup and win games like that more often than not. So that's kind of why it... It's a struggle for me to just say, hey, close with the same guys you were closing with last year. But that's kind of where the Suns find themselves in a way. And 
I'm just going to default to the lineup that was best last year. Maybe that's not fair to Royce O'Neal, given that he didn't have a full season. Maybe that changes. But I'm going to go with Grayson Allen. I, I probably wouldn't have said that, and it's not going to be my answer for the starters. I probably wouldn't have said that at the beginning of this offseason or even maybe a month ago, but I just can't get past the fact that this team scored 127 points per 100 possessions when the big three, Nurkic and Allen, were out there. That lineup had one of the best, was one of the best scoring units in the league. And I just think this team, until further notice, their identity is to score the ball. So I'm going to put the best group that can do that on the court when I want to put my best foot forward and, and, and take over a game and win it. So I'm going to go with Grayson in that fifth spot. I'm like you. I, I'm not in love with the idea that Nurkic has to be in here, but they don't have a better choice right now. The big three have to be there. So it was really just who's that, that other wing. And I'm going to go Grayson just because of how dominant he was with these guys last year. You know, you make a really, really valid point with the Grayson Allen argument. Because I'm a big fan of identity. What does this team do well? But we, we kind of saw that last year. This team scores the basketball really well. And they double and triple downed on that. Grayson Allen, to me, similar to Bradley Beal, and we'll, we'll get to him in just a little bit, too much redundancy in this team. And as much as I do agree, Grayson Allen is clearly in that starting five, was just awesome. One of the best starting fives in the league. If I'm not mistaken, if my statistics are right in the back of my head, the best starting five in the league. It's just different starting and closing games. And I would really feel better if I had someone who's a little bit bigger, maybe not thicker at this point, but a real true wing out there that maybe he's not the, you know, a Dorian Finney-Smith. But I just don't need Grayson Allen taking clutch shots for me late in games. I would feel much more comfortable with Kevin Durant and Devin Booker in the last seven or eight minutes a game getting most of the shots. Oftentimes last year, we had too many scenarios where Kevin Durant was not getting used properly in the fourth quarter, sitting in the corner, being a just a dummy on the sidelines and not being involved enough. I, I really like what you're saying in the Grace Now thing because it is a true identity for this team, and I think it's a very valid point. But I think that lineup that I've rolled out already has enough guys that can score the basketball. Do, do you get what I'm saying there? Yeah, I think that, look, the it's, it's a weird thing, right? Because Allen made the defense pay when they left him open, but I still think that at the end of the day, they are going to live with that outcome. They're going to live with... Allen being the guy to take a shot, even at 45% from three and even with 127 offensive ratings. So maybe there is something to be said for, you know, the way that the team's going to play when Royce O'Neal is out there a little bit more hoppy with the ball, obviously the size on the defensive end. I could see it working out. It's just a weird thing where I just broke it down in the stat sheet mm -hmm. um, here again, 77 possessions with O'Neal and those four. Last year, I don't know why that number was so low. I understand he got here late, but that still seems kind of a very, very small sample. So again, let's not read too much into it. But um, the defense was was just not good. And that part is weird to me. So maybe if you ask me a month into the season when they've played another 20 games together and the defense looks great with Royce, then the answer is a no-brainer. But I guess I just need to see it. That, that's a really good point because the defense is what I'm alluding to. So if I'm making the argument for Royce O'Neal and the numbers aren't there... I've always just leaned towards the fact of I'm just assuming all health. And if that's the case, when these guys can play just 30, I mean, 25 more games together, I would just assume that in defensive sets, they know each other like the back of their hand. They know where someone's going to be. They know when they'll have help side defense. They'll know that they won't have a guy cutting to the basket because someone didn't catch him back door. And I would just feel more confident in the Royce O'Neal thing, you know, I've yeah. kind of thought about this as well, is in a perfect world, and I, I hate to even kind of go down this path, but I will for a second. In a perfect world, this would be Ryan Dunn's spot. Like, this is where I would want Ryan Dunn to be. Now, I am really skeptical about that now because of his ability to shoot the ball, and it was so atrocious in the summer league, and part of it's like, if he can't score in the summer league, how is he going to score in the NBA right away? But if there is a chance that we can get taller, thicker Josh Akogi from the corner 
and then can actually shoot. I'm, I'm just asking for 33, 34% from three. That that's the Ryan Dunn thing. And that I think solves so many of the sun's issues. Have you thought about that? Have you thought about like, this is Ryan Dunn's spot that I would love for him to be closing games, be a defensive specialist and have a guy that I actually feel really good about taking out the other team's best player late in games. Yeah, I, I think Dunn is an obvious guy that if things click, you'd like you'd probably have him as your answer in both of the questions we're asking today, right? I mean, if, <laughs> yeah, if it yeah, if it actually works out and he can put the ball in the basket or provide some kind of offensive value as a rookie, then he should probably be starting and closing. And he's just he's just an answer. He's just a guy on this team all of a sudden. But yeah, let's jump to starting because I think that's probably the more interesting conversation and there's more names that I think could be candidates there, including smaller players, bigger players, and all of the above. So we'll get there coming up next. First, today's show brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook. You've heard us talk a ton about FanDuel here on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's America's number one sportsbook, but now we have something a little different for you. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with the YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out of market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and they let you cancel at any time. Think the Cardinals line moved from six and a half to five and a half over the course of the summer. I'm still a little nervous about that one, but hey, they didn't say anything about winning. You're betting and you're getting three weeks of NFL Sunday ticket. So maybe you just let the win be a cherry on top if the Cardinals pull off the cover or better yet, the W. Just visit FanDuel.com, download America's number one sports book, and try out that $5 bet. All right, Ben, let's keep it rolling here. So we talked about who should close. I think it's sort of the big three, a center, and who else? Starting is a very different conversation. I feel like Tyus Jones has to be in the starting lineup, mostly for the fact that he came here and accepted a minimum deal and all the fanfare that came with that. And that kind of complicates things right off the bat. So I already know where we're going to butt heads here. Let's just throw the gloves and let's just let's just duke it out here. Who do you want to start for the Suns this year? <laughs> you got to lead me off like that. Um I understand. I'm I mean, be ostracized you've already this. been on the show. Uh, I, think I get you, it. You, you you gave your hand away the last no, time. So we I did. I did. And I, I get it. I just want to shift the blame to someone else. <laughs> I understand it sounds crazy. I would go Tyus Jones, Devin Booker, Royce O'Neal, Kevin Durant, Yusuf Nurkic. Now there's an obvious guy missing from that lineup. $50 million man, Bradley Beal. And the first thing everyone goes to is he makes $50 million. And I asked you this question, and I understand it's kind of a loaded question, but it was, are we even having this conversation if he makes $50 million? And I just don't care. I'm not counting the guy's pockets. He's still going to get $50 million coming off the bench. I've already mentioned he's going to close games. I've already mentioned he's going he's gonna to play 35 minutes a night still. Bradley Beal, similar to the problem with Grayson Allen closing games, is just too much redundancy in a Suns offense that needs to be predicated on Kevin Durant and Devin Booker and someone getting them the ball. I, I, I Sure, I'm cool with the occasional Royce O'Neal jumper. I'm cool with the occasional Yusuf Nurkic around the rim or a lob. I just want the offense to flow through two of the top 10 best players in the NBA. I, I don't think that that's so crazy. And the Suns team lacked so much depth last year. I feel so much better allowing Bradley Beal to come off the bench and cook and be Wizards Bradley Beal. I know it sounds crazy. I get it. It comes off as a hot take. But if I was Mike Boonholzer, I'm just trying to put the guys in the best player to succeed or in the best uh, in the best places to succeed. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's what you need to do with Bradley Beal. The last, the place you ended with that is exactly the place that I focus when it comes to this conversation. And I will give you credit and I will back off of my uh, aggressive <laughs> anti this take. Okay. Because it's become more and more widespread. 
if you look at, obviously, Charles Barkley gave voice to it right after the season ended. I think actually multiple times he said this, uh, but he, you know, he, he tends to just say some things. Um, <laughs> but I've heard more and more people who actually follow this kind of thing closely and whether it's locally or nationally, there's there's more voice to it. And I actually think that that matters, that it's kind of like out there because that starts to plant the seeds. And Mike Budenholzer, who you mentioned, is the person that I think about the most when it comes to making this happen. If the team feels like this is something that would make them better, more balanced, deeper, whatever way you want to put it, it is up to the head coach to make that case. It is up to the head coach to carve out a rotation that makes sense and all the different things that would have to go in there. However, I'm glad we started where we did because no matter what, even if I give in on the starting and maybe Beal doesn't make the most sense and this and that, he has to close. You're not going to pay a guy that much money and have him play 18 minutes and just be a bench guy and not be out there when the games matter. That's crazy. But if he's not starting, but he's still playing a lot of minutes, I think we can both be on the same page there. I guess I just circle back to this point. My starting lineup is pretty traditional. It's very small. It's the big three. It's Tyus and it's Nurkic. The one that you would kind of just put on paper based on what everything we know about this team. I just feel like the Tyus Jones signing already made me wonder about Grayson Allen's fit and if it can always be maximized and, and his value can be at its, at its highest. If you're telling me that him and Beal are both coming off the bench you're kind of just having a different version of the same debate that is leading you to say book and Beal don't fit in the starting lineup. The Suns just have three guys who are three of their best players with book Beal and Grayson who do too many of the same things. So I guess I think this is kind of where we got to when we talked about it last time. I just, I, I guess it's like, it's an imperfect roster. I just want to put my best guys on the court. And that's why I kind of just come down with, it's not, my favorite idea ever, but you got to just start Beal. So I'm so Tyus Jones, Bradley Beal, Royce O'Neal, Kevin Durant, Yusuf Nurkic. So we just we just um, very differently on the Bradley Beal and uh, Tyus Jones front. Yeah, here's well, no, because I have Book instead of Royce. So I have yeah Tyus and Beal. You have Tyus and oh Tyus Royce. Beal and Book obviously. I was. I just tried to start six guys on your team, which would be very good uh, uh, in a playoff game. That's if we can do it. I'm going. If with we six. could, yeah, if we yeah. get away with it, yeah. You mentioned a really good point, especially with the with the Grayson Allen thing. I, I get it. I'm just not worried as much of Grayson Allen's fit on this team later on because I just need to see the thing that just drove me the most insane last year is the Suns had a top ten player in Kevin Durant. I'm okay at times with Devin Booker being phased out of the offense because, because Kevin Durant is there. And Devin Booker recently has started to show, especially in the Olympics, he can do a lot of other things. He can play make. He can, the world is seeing he is a much better defender than people give him credit for. He's not Mikhail Bridges, but he's also not Steph Curry on the defensive end. And so I just have issues with, trying to predicate this offense or trying to cater this offense at all around Grace Allen in the second unit. At that point, you are playing as well as likely the other team's second unit. So I'm just and it's thinking, and match, it right? yeah, I'm just thinking it'll be easier to figure out the, the second unit with Grace and Allen and Bradley Beal yeah. in the second unit going up against other teams in the first unit. I'm just more worried about wanting to make that work. Because last year, it was so bad and so hard to watch. And I get it. It comes off as crazy, and I get it too. I have to think and go, man, am I really thinking this too? Do I really want to sit a guy who's averaged 30 points a game before on the bench? But we are in an imperfect roster. And last yeah. year, to all the Suns fans that, that get upset about this, we watched it last year. Now you could say, and I think it's a very fair argument, this team didn't play enough games together. But what we did see, they got swept. They were, it wasn't a competition in any game. Bradley Beal was awful in the final so one. Here's, here's, I feel like actually where we're both getting to though, is the starting unit was not the one that made us pull our hair out last year, right? 
it was the end of games. I mean, yes, there were some ugly first quarters, the Clippers toward the end of the season when they put up like single digit points. And I'm not going to say the beginning of games was, was not a problem, but it was the fourth quarter and their, and their inability to keep leads or come back or really do anything when games got close. That was a, a big killer for them. So that feels like the portion of maybe we're not actually giving enough credence in that closing lineup conversation to could Tyus Jones fight his way into that more than we're giving him credit for to be that. I mean, why did you get him if not for those moments? Right. And I guess, yeah, I mean, maximizing that might be the most important version of all of this. And I, yeah, I just, it's, it's, they, they got so much deeper and yet they got deeper at the same exact positions (laughs) that they had. guys. Yes. And that's yes. kind of the weird thing that I feel like is is killing them where they just they don't have a complete they don't have a complete rotation right now. And it's just about picking the the best of all these evils. Let's zoom out here though. Talk about the league, talk about kind of the the way you have to match up, the flexibility that I think is very clearly key in so many of the best teams right now in the West and beyond. We'll get there next. All right, Ben. So we'll close it out right here. Um, I have four teams in the West that I went through quickly to talk about where they are when it comes to lineup options versus where the Suns are, right? So I look at Minnesota. Obviously, their three bigs is probably their biggest strength when it comes to their versatility. We saw what Nas Reed can do. We know what Cat is. Rudy Gobert is a defensive player of the year. Even at guard. Mike Conley didn't close every game against the Suns because Nikhil Alexander-Walker had the series of his freaking life. Dallas, the two different centers. They now have Clay Thompson, where if he's hot or if he's feeling physically good enough to play solid defense or the matchup's right, they can close with him or they can put him on the bench and look more like they looked in their finals run. OKC, they now have a real center. They can do that or have Chet at the center spot. They have like seven different wings who are all very, very good. And even Denver, not so much this year because of their losses, but I think back to 2023 when they beat the Suns and won a championship, they had this kind of trump card where they could put Bruce Brown on the court if they wanted to have a better defensive tone setter out there, maybe some more ball handling. Or, of course, they could go with Michael Porter Jr. and have the, the shooting and scoring that he provided. So... It's really been the calling card, not to mention Boston, what the Knicks look like now. You have to have this in the NBA. And so I guess where I wanted to come back to as we sum up the debates we had on the closing and the starting and all that stuff is our answers weren't that different. And that worries me. The Suns don't have that many different options as far as what they can do here. And they're still just counting on their big three playing better and playing better together. That's your, everybody's tired of hearing me say that we're all tired of thinking it, but that's just where I come down. You build a roster this way. Your best three guys have to just be up to the task, no matter what the other team looks like. Yeah. And and let me be optimistic here because I don't think it's a facade and I don't think I'm blowing smoke. The Phoenix suns. I, I don't think it's just, and you have said it, and I don't mean to think you're discounting it, but we should just discount that they're going to be better next year. It, with those three guys, it's going to take time. They're not going to get any worse. They're absolutely going to get better. How much better? It's yet to be seen. But here's something this team has that I'll go, I'll say it's on blue in the face. They have pieces that can be moved. That's a whole episode for another day sure. to make this team more flexible because they have shooting at positions that people want. And Again, trade machine for another day, but a Grayson Allen comes to mind. A Yusuf Nurkic expiring contract comes to mind. The Suns actually have options this year. It wasn't like last year. And this is where I got to give the front office its much due praise. They got Tyus Jones for nothing. That is another position that a guy is going to occupy in the playoffs, pushing guys down the roster spots. You already have Bradley Beal. You already have Kevin Durant. You already have Devin Booker. There is a scenario where if the Suns are much better than we think early on in the season, the trade deadline comes around and they add a wing or they add a position of note that can add the flexibility of this team. I don't think it's doom and gloom from that standpoint. 
I believe they have real options. And if they play their cards right and methodically, like they pretty much have done all off season long, they could do like what the Celtics did. The reason why the Celtics contained uh, uh, Luka Doncic because they took a playbook out of the whole LeBron James thing. We're just going to get every wing and we're going to throw him at you every single play. And when that guy gets tired, there's a guy coming off the bench that's going to do the same thing. It's what the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves did to the Suns all series long. They just threw Nikhil Alexander Walker. They just threw uh, McDaniels. They just threw Anthony Edwards. And they said, once these guys get tired, we got another dude on the bench. I think there is a potential for the Suns to get real roster flexibility. I don't think this roster is as doomed to fail that we didn't really see last year. And so that's where I'm at with this. And does that make you feel any better? Yeah, I'm on the same page as you. I was I was leading us there. I'm I'm very much I mean, I people get tired of hearing me talk about trades all the time, but really the reason I do it is because we all thought there would be one this summer and there wasn't, which just tells me not that there's never going to be one, just that it hasn't happened yet. And I think that it will. And all those names that you mentioned are the places to look just uh, for the sake of, um, I guess, building on the optimism or just expanding on your point in terms of a trade can be part of what gets the Suns to have more of this flexibility and have different options, depending on the matchup and the opponent. Also development. You mentioned Ryan Dunn. Not only does he check the boxes in terms of just a better version of what you're kind of hoping for with Royce O'Neal, but He also allows the Suns to play small a little bit more easily if they ever wanted to go that route and try to just, again, based on who they're playing, maybe have a unit where Duran is playing center and they're putting as much size around that. Dunn, as we saw, you mentioned Summer League. One thing he definitely did that translated was the the second side rim protection as as a wing. That's a rare skill that he has and something that you could envision putting on into a small lineup and having it really thrive. If Osui Godaro is able to develop, Likewise, he's a center that can do a lot of different things than the more groundbound older guys that the Suns have ahead of him in the depth chart. And Bull Bull, I know you laughed. I got some defenders in the comments. <laughs> I did see the defenders this, in the comments. Guy, I did as well. I mean, <laughs> you watched the team last year. By the playoffs, yeah. he was out of the rotation. But from about January, February through April, <laughs> he was a rotation player. He's also 25 years old. He had never been a rotation player before. He had never really gotten minutes before. I'm not saying he's going to be a starter for this group by the end of the season, but he's another guy that could help them have a little bit more flexibility. He's a long way from closing games for a team that wants to win a title. But if you're tech, if you're asking about the regular season, I think he can be an ingredient that helps them, um, again, develop this type of lineup versatility to survive different types of teams over 82 games. I think all three of those guys getting better would be another part of how they gain this, even if that big trade isn't there or doesn't quite hit the way we want it to. So yeah, I'm definitely optimistic. I I think that this team's obviously deeper. They already have more options than they did last season. It's just about getting another couple of layers of depth, I think, on top of what they have. You know, I shouldn't laugh about the bowl bowl thing, but it's hard sometimes because I think sometimes Suns fans often will look at this player and think, man, this is just untapped potential. I believe if Bull Bull was going to be that guy, he already would have by now. I've kind of rode the ship off of Bull Bull being a key playoff rotational piece, but you said it last year made me more optimistic. If I'm being honest, I was exactly where you are last year, Mm -hmm. but then he came in and had the best season of his career. He had the most impactful to winning season of his entire career, played more like a big man rather than just somebody out there playing, you know, like an and one mixtape guy. And he actually (laughs) did things that he needed to do to to contribute. I I feel better coming off last season than I did going in. And that's why I'm a believer. You play the tape from 12 months ago. I was laughing off the idea this guy could be (laughs) anything. But I I really have like come come to believe in him as somebody who could be at eighth, ninth man on a on a pretty good team. Yeah, okay. Eighth, ninth man at his somewhat full potential because I understand his, his full potential could be untapped. Mm-hmm. I believe that we are much more likely of getting a playoff run up to the playoffs guy in the last 20 games of the season that pops. I have much more faith in an Oso Iguodaro or a Ryan Dunn figuring it out totally. more so a Ryan, more, more so a Ryan Dunn. And yeah. 
it's hard not to get excited about Ryan Dunn because you see what he does, especially at Virginia. I had a guy on Fox Sports 910 that covered Virginia basketball, and he was like, man, this guy is going to get points just slashing to the basket. If he can just fix the jumper, and I'm not, again, I'm not asking for 35%. If he can be a 33% guy or just make people pay enough to where they have to cheat on him and they don't have a Josh Okogie thing, yep. I mean, seriously, man, I think the Suns team can be so scary with a 6'8 guy who has, like I think, a 6'10 wingspan, an athletic guy. The Suns are really, and I know this is kind of further and a little bit, a little kind of crazy. The Suns are one Derek Lively away from a Derek Lively-esque player that can help contribute to this team like Ryan Dunn can from being a favorite in the Western Conference? Question mark? Like, I, I, I hate to say that. young, athletic, different, you, like two-way you know player. This, but people, I don't think, understand how much Derek Lively meant to that team. A lengthy guy that can rim run and play really good defense. I, Ryan Dunn, I'm, I'm not out on the guy. And I do believe the Oso and Ryan are of the I'm of the belief that those guys are more keen to being playoff spots than a bull bull who I think I, I've kind of already seen it. I like the guy and he's a fan favorite and he's fun to have, right? David Peralta was fun to have on the Diamondbacks. When he was gone, I wasn't really crying about it. <laughs> yeah, look, I think uh so this I pulled up before we hit record. The way I've been thinking about it with Dunn, Josh Kogi, there's some kind of baseline there. He and I've said it a million times, it's not just the jumper. With him, he's not a good enough finisher. He's not a good enough passer. He turns the ball over. So he is overall a significant negative on offense and is unplayable on that end of the court. When this, when he was on the court last year, the Suns scored at a 115.7 offensive rating. Not quite as terrible as you would guess, but not good enough. It would be below league average. If Dunn can be better than that, I think you're talking about something. And like you said, it's not going to be that he starts raining threes. It's can he cut? Can he get offensive rebounds? Can he score in transition? Can he stack up enough components of impacting the game on the offensive end that when he's out there, it doesn't kill them. And if he can, we are going to be talking about him this season, but I'm in, in agreement. I guess if I were to rank it, I might say like the pathway to them getting, the, the flexibility that I think we agree that they need probably goes something like trade done and then maybe bowl and Oso tied, maybe Oso a little bit higher, <laughs> you know, just because of the, the depth chart, you know, I'm, I think more with Oso, whereas bowl plays a position, the Suns really are going to probably rely on him to play some Oso is behind two vets. That's kind of how I see it. So yeah, done is done is certainly ahead of bowl. That that's a great point to make. Um, who knows with how good Suns fans say Bull Bull is and how funny he is? Who knows? You might just be able to trade him for Dorian Finney Smith straight up. So <laughs> we will do trades, I, I guess. Listen, uh, at, at the, the vibes, after, the right? vibes are good. The vibes are good with Bull Bull. <laughs> You're gonna be a believer by the end of the season. You gotta you gotta hear <laughs> I'm me open talk minded. through it a little bit. I'm more. open minded. You you, you I, were, I hope it happens. He was doing stuff and you were looking over there. You were, I don't know. You were <laughs> I wasn't paying attention now. No, because yeah. whenever he was in, they were down by 20 points. <laughs> He was playing minutes for this <laughs> yeah. team. You're asking, you're so disrespectful. Why'd they re-sign him then? If he, because uh, I feel like I have to be. They like, just like him around the balance, they, they, right? He's a good. Like, no, he likes I, TV like, that they like, or what's up? There is something to him being a real locker room guy. He's a fan favorite. I he's think a, he's. He a, was a good player last. He's year. no. He listen. Well, okay, good. He was. He was good as role. the he tenth He played like player. twelve minutes a game. Okay, all right. Well, if he was uh, as uh, at his role, yes, he was. He was the who's he was the JJ Barea of the tenth <laughs> of the tenth player coming off the sure. bench role, except but like not J four feet taller than JJ Barea. Well, yes, I'm just yeah. I'm equating him. I didn't think JJ Barea was seven two. Okay. No, no, no. I know. I'm just <laughs> laughing at that. We picked the tallest and the shortest players in the NBA for that comp. I don't disagree, but it's just uh, all right. Then we're at an agreement. Okay, so. <laughs> Yeah, at some point we'll have to make a bet on how many games does Bull Bull close this season. Um, I, I'm if not it's more I'm than not, look. I'm not telling you it's going to be fifty. I, I'm like I was thinking in the back of my head on the over under like five. Okay, so um, <laughs> I was good, and I was going to say uh, 
Yeah. I, I was going to say, and if he closes more than 10, we're probably someone's injured. And that's probably not a good yeah. thing. <laughs> Something went very wrong Something or very right wrong. there. All right. That'll wrap us up. Appreciate you rolling with us as we get our feet underneath us with this new era of Locked On Suns. Hit follow or subscribe if you have not already. We'll be back with you Friday to close out the week as more Suns news rolls in and the NBA season inches closer and closer. Enjoy your Wednesday. Enjoy your Thursday. We'll be back to close the week.